Um, so up next, we have the honor of having our keynote speaker as uh, Dr. Colon Rivera. Um, he's a distinguished general adolescent and addiction psychiatrist in the Pennsylvania medical community. He has a broad experience in community-based programs with an emphasis on those that help to increase access to assisted medical treatment for patients with substance use disorders. He is a medical director of the Asociación Puerto Riqueña en Marcha Inc. Behavioral Health Program, APM, in a nonprofit organization dedicated to improve the quality of life of Hispanic communities through the direct behavioral and substance use disorder services in the Philadelphia region. APM has functions related to education, health, human services, community, foster homes, and economic development. Dr. Colon Rivera is also an attending telemedicine physician and a participant in a grant funded by the NIH Environmental Influences of Child Health Outcomes Initiatives at the Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic and UPMC. He's part of a team working on an emerging community program to increase rural access to medication-assisted treatments for patients with substance use disorders. Dr. Colon Rivera serves as a clinical advisor for the Advisory on Alcohol and Other Drug Committees for the State of Pennsylvania under the Governor Wolf Administration and the Senior Advisor for the Opioid State Targeted Response Te <laughs> Technical Assistance for Puerto Rico. So without further ado, here is Dr. Colon Rivera. And so two words I like that you mentioned, inclusion and equity, and I'm gonna talk a lot about that, okay? I think, perfect. I do speak loud, so I don't know if I need this. Um, so, yeah, it's my first time in Minnesota. Yes, I love it so far. My Lyft driver, when I asked him, what do you do in Minnesota? He was like, oh, you should go to the mall. <laughs> a mall? What, what do I wanna go to a mall? It's like, oh, cause it's really big. I'm coming from Philadelphia, you know? I mean, I know malls. So my name's Hector. My patients call me Dr. Hector. Uh, last name's Colon Rivera. I always say Dr. Hector cause sometimes you get Dr. Hector, Dr. Rivera. Dr. Rivera Colon. So Dr. Hector's easier. Uh, we're gonna talk about hope against opioid and eliminating health inequities in our Latino communities. And I said our Latino communities, because we're gonna talk about all communities, right? I'm in Philadelphia. I run a nonprofit organization, 5,000 patients, 80% of them are Latino Hispanic. Okay, so that's a lot of people. I mean, the other 20% are either Caucasians or African American. And we want to be all inclusive, so we're improving and expanding to those communities as well. Okay? There is no a clicker? No, clicker, no. Okay, you just do it. Okay, we can go to the next one. Um, so, conflict of interest, I don't think I have a conflict of interest, but I put a bunch of stuff that might cause some conflict of interest. Again, I'm the medical director for a nonprofit organization. I run an organization in Puerto Rico, Creal Con Salud, it's another nonprofit. And what we do is workshops for other nonprofits about over, uh, uh, burnout, mindfulness, I mean, other things. And after Maria, the Hurricane Maria, we have been there maybe 20 something times in Puerto Rico in the past two years. I'm going back in January. Um, I'm Puerto Rican, so that's a conflict of interest, Yay. right? <laughs> I work for the University of Pittsburgh, so they fly me around uh, to go to rural areas and, and create programs. Uh, next time I'm going to Seneca, I don't know if you're familiar with, with Pennsylvania, but it's west close to Ohio, right? In between West Virginia, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, they're fighting to the first place in terms of overdoses, okay? 2016, well, West Virginia was first. 2017, we're winning. Pennsylvania is winning. That's not great. You don't want to be the first place. But those three places are always in the first three places. And you know, fighting for who, is, has, who has more death in terms of overdosing, right? We don't want that. But that's why they fly me around between Philadelphia and Pittsburgh. There's no thing in between. There's seven hours of no treatment, of driving. Okay, so it's all rural area. It's a lot of pockets, community pockets, that have no services. That's why I do a lot of telemedicine and technology with them, okay? Um, 
American Psychiatric Association and the president for the Hispanic Caucus. That might be a conflict of interest. I don't know. Triple uh, AP, so I'm the representative for Area 3, which means Delaware, Virginia, DC, Pennsylvania, and others. So I do write a lot of bills and sit with uh, political people and you know how politics are and that might be a conflict of interest. But I don't know, I just put them all there. You decide if they're conflict of interest, okay? Uh, well, I'm here with the opioid response network and who knows what the opioid response network is? Great, only a few people. <laughs> we should market that better. Uh, so it's totally free for whoever has something to, uh, to do with opioids, right? You call these guys, they talk to you, they have their consultants, and if you have a question about how to create, how do I create an opioid clinic, or how do I create a suboxone clinic, or do you have any resources in Spanish, with they, which I don't have a lot, so that's, that's not great, uh, but they're there for you guys, okay? So please, Next one, next one. So that's the information you need, okay? Email us, call us, we will answer the phone, okay? And I'm the senior advisor for Puerto Rico, so everything that is in Spanish or need translation, I will do that for them, okay? Next. Okay, so objective. Let's start with the presentation now. So let's, we will talk about causes of the opioid epidemic and impacts to the Hispanic communities. I'm gonna talk about numbers, right? And I'm here for you. I want this to be super interactive. I can talk about number like for weeks. I don't wanna throw you a lot of graft and talk about how this is increasing, how this is increasing. I do wanna talk to you, right? I mean, I, I'm pretty excited about this. We have been talking about this. I mean, you guys preparing this uh, presentation for a year, right? But I've been hearing about this for about two months now, <laughs> so I'm really excited, okay? I couldn't sleep last night, not just because of the fly, <laughs> because of the excitement. Um, we're gonna talk about risk factors and protective factors, and actually being Hispanic it could be a, his, uh, a protective factors, we, and we'll talk more about that. Um, review clinical diagnosis criteria to assess, treat opioid disorder. I'm not gonna get too in deep about treatment percent and doses, doses of medication. I will mention some treatments, okay? But not too much about how you induct someone on methadone versus suboxone versus, unless you have questions about that, okay? And the time for actions now, right? Now, yesterday now, okay? Not today now. And why the action is now? Well. When we talk about Hispanics, right, and who's Hispanic, who believes Hispanic, who has some Hispanic genetic, 4%, 5%, 1%, 0.5%, .5 Hispanic. Okay, so the majority is not Hispanic, which is great. Latinas, or Latinx, or Mexicano. Mexicano. Okay, well, I'm Puerto Rican, so I, I think I am Hispanic. Um, my wife is Indian, and she believes it's Hispanic, so we'll see. Um, so who knows how, what's the percentage of physicians that are Hispanic right now, or social workers, or, or nurses? Give me a number, from one to a hundred, or one to two thousand, I don't know. Give me a number. Five, how? one, one. <laughs> Three percent. Three percent, that's really close. 3% in the nation of physicians are Hispanic. 4% social workers, one point something nurses, so it's really low. Versus, and that's one part of the spectrum, the other part of the spectrum, how many Hispanics are in prison service, in the justice system, are homeless, have no transportation, Is a lot. Our prisons are full of Hispanic, right? Uh, full of African Americans versus leadership, CEOs of companies, less than 3%. 3%. So 
huge. Let's forget about females and Hispanic females, because that's like a lot lower. But in general, it's really, really low. Okay, next one. So let's talk about a normal story that I deal with every day, right? So we have a 20 years old patient show into my office, right? She has been using for three years. Her physician prescribed opioid to relieve her pain, right? She, had, she was a soccer player. She injured her foot, and she was prescribed oxycodone. Okay, when the doctor tapered her medication, she, she began using heroin. Is that normal? That story, have you heard it before? Yeah. A lot of times, a lot of times. You can change the name, you can change the color of her skin, the face, put some beard, put her some glasses. Same, similar. Next, this is mom talking. I couldn't find any place for her. There was no list of treatment centers. No treatment centers near her home. And she was due to arrive there the day after she was found dead. So the help got there way too late. So, next slide. This happened in Minnesota. And why her? Well, she's not, she's not Hispanic, right? But when you look for Minnesota, she was a pretty high case in Minnesota, right? She was in the, her 20s and she was found dead. Physicians start her on opioids and they couldn't find help. Same situation happened every day. She was found dead. No history of opioid use disorders before. No one that knocks her with that disorder. She never got help. And I, I say this story because I deal with this every day. I see about 40 something patients between telemedicine and my practice in Philadelphia a day. 20% of my patients have some type of substance use disorder. 35% of my patients are adolescents. Okay? Next slide. So the facts. Next slide. Opioid disorders frequently begin in the adolescent and young adults. What's the average of people starting using drugs? The average age. 13, start with alcohol, they smoke, the age of 13. By the age of 16, they start using marijuana. By the age of 20s, opioids, um, usually in college, or they found them at home, right? So opioids from mom, opioids from dad, they are around. Oh, okay. It feels good when you take it. It gives you a high. Right? You feel invisible, especially if you're playing sports. You feel good. Okay? Treatment is recommended by major professional organizations. That's a fact. However, one out of four of patients meeting criteria for a substance disorder get treatment. Okay? Trends and disparities are significant, and that change. And it's the same for Caucasian, right? It's significant, there are significant disparities in terms of treatment, not only for Hispanic, not only for African Americans or Native Americans. One out of four ensure obvious disorders of treatment, we talk about that. We know that treatment works. So why are we not treating? We need to fight this together. We cannot do it alone. I mean, you saw my conflict of interest slide, but pretty sure partnership, you cannot do this alone. I always say to my wife, I need, if I was taller, stronger, <laughs> have two heads, need, need to sleep, maybe some kind of vampire that can't walk in, in the light, I want to do more, but I'm human, okay? I'm not, I'm not a superhero, but if it was for me, I would decide not to sleep and do what I can. But that's not possible, and I cannot do it alone. So that's why I have I wear many hats, because different hats has different purposes. Next. Opioids versus op 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 opiates versus opiates, and I put this here because language is really important. 
Okay, uh, I, I hear a lot and drive me crazy, especially with the polit when I meet with the politi politicians. Uh, and I was with Governor Wolf two days ago because he invited us, some leaders in the Hispanic community to celebrate the Hispanic heritage, right? And, and we were talking about wine and beer. I was like, let's talk about opioid disorder. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want wine. What kind of wine you want, red or white? What about opioid disorder? Um, <laughs> so what's the difference between opioids and opioids? And I think language is really important because we mix them up. And um, so opioids are usually natural ones, right? The opioids are the ones that are semi, synthetic. So opioids, uh, morphine and codeine are the main ones, right? And probably heroin is also opioid versus opioid are the ones created in a lab or semi created on the lab. Uh, so that's for you guys to take. I would say don't use the word addicts, okay? People with substance use disorders, okay? Also addiction, school, uh, AMSA use it, the American Society for uh, Addiction Medicine, they use it a lot, addiction, but never addicts, okay? People that suffer from substance disorder, they're dealing with substance use, that's okay, that's fine. Also, medication assisted treatment have some connotation that they need help with medication. Like we, don't, we don't call diabetes, the medication for diabetes assisted treatment, even though more people don't use the insulin. That's driving me crazy, right? I have more people abusing or not using insulin that, than taking the suboxone, the methadone. That drive me nuts. You use your insulin this morning. No, doctor, I forgot. Come on, right? Boom, 400 the sugar levels, you need to go to the ER. My patients using Suboxone are more <laughs> compliant with their medication than people that had I treat with diabetes. Um, next slide. So I don't wanna overwhelm you with this, but I think it's really important to understand opioid versus synthetic opioids, because yes, and we'll talk about the facts later and the causes, but everything started with pain medication, painkillers. Right? And we know it. I mean, I don't know if it's really hard, unless you live in a cave, not to know what's going on with the pharma, Purdue pharmacies, right? The Stagger family and, and all these guys and, and, and what happened in the 90s and MS content. It's really hard not to hear about this. Unless, I mean, Twitter is full of this. I'm a social media guy. Uh, for, for me, it's super hard not to hear from this. But, we need to talk about this because every started from painkiller, but the second wave was heroin, the third wave was fentanyl, the fourth wave we're having is the benzos, and then we're having a, fa a fifth wa wave of overdose. Now it's with the met methamphetamines and the stimulants are going up. And I know this because I'm meeting with Pennsylvania governor next week because we have an increase of 30% on the use of meth. People with opioid use disorder are presented with the ER, 30% are positive for meth. And the tricky part about meth is that you can make it anywhere. In your kitchen. Your kids can help you to make it. You, just, you can Google the ingredients to do it. You watch Breaking Bats, which is a great show, and you learn <laughs> how to make it in your kitchen. Cheap to make, you can sell it for, exp I mean, for a good price, right? And then we talk about disparities, social, economy, right? Okay, next. You can click and click and click. <laughs> <laughs> there are different mechanisms, it's just to, you know, they, I just want to put this out there because they don't work the same, the same way, right? Some of them are partial agonists, which means they don't, they don't block, but they don't activate the receptor. Methanol is a full agonist. I mean, some of them are dual mechanism, like tramadol. Uh, so there is a gamma of opioids out there. I just need you to know that when I talk about opioids, I'm talking about whatever is not on that screen, right? Painkillers, methadone, uh, buprenorphine, all of that is abusable, okay? Next. So the causes, next. Back, yep. 
So uh, I, I call this is the twister, right? The big storm, the, the hurricane category six. I know that doesn't exist, but it's more, it's a, it's a cyclone. It's more than the, the, the hurricane <laughs> five, right? So everything was, all this was going on at the same time, right? Someone 40 years ago wrote something to say the chronic use of opioids medications, pain medications, doesn't create op dependency. It was a letter, maybe this big. It was a paragraph that say, I've never seen someone taking opioid for a long period of time creating tolerance or dependency. This reference was cited in hundreds and hundreds of other studies. Pharma use it as a reference. Boom. Next. The Joint Commission created a fifth vital science because of this. You need to treat pain. If you don't treat pain, I will not pay you, right? And if CMS, Medicare, Medicaid doesn't pay the, 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 the hospitals or your practice, right? They, they have this funding formula, and if, if the patient is, doesn't feel that is, your pain has been treated fairly, right? you don't get paid. So what the hospital did, they give you pain medication because mm -hmm. I don't want you to complain. Mm -hmm. Also, when I get paid. So fifth vital signs, so we have blood pressure, mm -hmm. temp, respiratory rate, pulse, and now we created the pain level. And how we know pain? One to 10, sir. How was your pain today? Five. Five. <laughs> Not too low. I think you might need some oxycodone. <laughs> 30, two months, I will see you in six months, okay? <laughs> that was the game. Next. And then these guys, the Salixto guys, I'm not a fan, right? But I think it was one of the most the famous uh, I wouldn't call it gang, but it was a big family. So these two guys met in a, in a prison, and this guy called Max, he was American. This guy called something Salixto, he was Mexican. And the Mexican had a big family in Mexico, a new small towns, a lot of family, a lot of man work. And my friend Max, he knew about hospitals and health system and how to get the opioid. They created an empire of, it was like the Uber, the Lyft of drugs back then. It's like asking for pizza, right? I want a large takeout and, and it started in small towns. A lot of people taking drugs everywhere. Okay, do you have money, sir? I have something for you, five bucks. Do you have money now? Here's a sample. We'll come back next week. Is it your birthday? I will give you one sample today. You get hooked, I come back next week, right? So that's what we're doing. Then they expanded to Miami and other places, and you know what happened next. Farm company, of course, Contin, MS Contin, they promised that it was not addicted, and people started using it. And now in 2007, we're still in 2019, right? I mean, 12 years later, it was charged for misbranding, and 12 years later, it was still in the same situation, and we didn't see the overdose spiking until 2010, 2013, right? And all of this started in 2017, so we were in 2007, so we could have prevented what was going on now, but you know the rest. Uh, healthcare providers, of course, I mean, all these tweeters and stuff, uh, uh, Twister of stuff. Of, so healthcare provider wrote 72.4 opioid prescription per 100 first people. Tell me that makes sense. <laughs> right? And it's still, today, they're still prescribing 50A. Are we all in pain? <laughs> I don't get it, right? It's hard for me. I never prescribed a prescription for oxycodone in my life. My life. Never. Um, 
And prescription opioids is, is, is currency, right? We have these pain meals and people doing these pain clinics with no, with no, <laughs> no board in pain medications or pain treatment, no experience. And they were scamming Medicaid and Social Security. And here, in, I mean, Pennsylvania, we, we, we close a lot of clinics because of it. And they keep popping out somewhere else. Okay, next. Uh, and it's okay to eat from the cookie jar, right? So all this expanded to sports. Opioid addiction was also driven by high school, college sports. And this was in 2015. After the game, some of the trainer pulled out a large jar and handed out Oxycontin to their players. Here you are, just share it. If that runs out, call me. I will have one more, okay, for you guys. Let's celebrate, okay? Stigma, right, it's another part of the twister. Uh, well, I mean, addiction is a, when we call it a substance disorder, we talk about brain disease. So people with substance disorder are often, they're, they're marked, they're framed, they are stamped, labeled with being an addict, right? Mm -hmm. I say no, use the word addict, but that's how they label. <laughs> um, language use, a stigma healthcare in society are, are large, so every time you meet with someone, please use the right words. Mm -hmm. That's really important, okay? Uh, stigma prevent people from seeking care, that's true. Whereas um, in healthcare teams can send a powerful message. So again, from, and, and this is, is something that I'm still dealing in my, in my pro, uh, nonprofit organization. It has to start from the receptionist, from the security guard that's outside. The one that opened the door for the patients is not only the physicians that need to be educated about this. If you want this to work, we need to speak the same language, right? Customer service. We are not training customer service in, in, health, in the health system. And sounds like business, but if you want someone to get help, you need to treat him well or treat her well, and that's customer service. Right, open the door, welcome, blah, blah, blah. If you look at as someone that's lower and smell or not dress, he will not come back. Okay, so who are we? Latinos, who are we? Well, I mean, you guys need, do you guys know this, right? Who are we? I don't know, I ask myself that every day when I wake up. Who are you? Uh, so both terms, Hispanic and Latino, are not a race, but instead of ethnicity, I mean, use, and, and this is interesting, right? Because the federal law defines Hispanic as those who classify themselves in one of the specific Hispanic or Latino. So we, we can all be Hispanic. If you want, all right? I mean, themselves. Um, it's about 52 million Hispanic living in the United States. Uh, it depends what, where you look, what number you look. Uh, I think it, it, the, the number changed between 17, 20 percent. Uh, they're saying by 2050, 2050 will be more than 30, between 30 and 50. So we're not going anywhere. We keep pop, popping out from different places, right? We're growing, we're expanding, moving places. Next. Um, and this is really important because it's 2019, so we're talking about, what, 20 years ago that the Surgeon General report this, a report of the gen uh, Surgeon General that not all Americans, especially minorities, receive equal mental health treatment. And substance disorder are under mental health treatment. Some states haven't uh, separated. Pennsylvania is one of them. They have two budgets. I don't know how it is in Minnesota if you have two budgets versus one budget. Maybe someone can answer that question. One budget, two budgets, two budgets, yeah. right, right. There's so one <laughs> it's one division, but two budgets, and that's something creates some issues, right? Because you cannot bu move budgets around, and mental health usually gets a little bit more budget uh, than substance disorders. However, because of the opioid epidemic, they're getting a lot of money injected, uh, but the injection of money has some timelines, and you need to do something between two years. Usually it's two years, and you can expand it for maybe five years, but after that, if you don't use the money, you lose it. Uh, uh, so in 2001, 18 years ago, the clear message was, oh, kosher count. Okay, 18 years ago, whatever that means, but next. Uh, 
So people of color may not seek services, and those are fact, cannot access treatment, drop out of care, misdiagnose, uh, seek care only when they're in illness, it is an advantage stage. So this is really important. I mean, non-Hispanic, right, versus Hispanic, when they use substances, it's a big difference, right? People with, that are non-Hispanic probably drink a little more than Hispanics. But if you are Hispanic, the chances of creating chronic issues are higher. Okay, so Hep C, HIV, inject, injecting drug, those risk factors are higher for those that are Hispanic. So what happened? We need more care. We need more chronic care. We are a lot more expensive to the health system. Okay? Some protective factors, and this is pretty cool because people that come from different countries and they keep their ad identity, right? So if I'm Mexican or Puerto Rican and I keep calling myself Puerto Rican and I keep uh, eating rice and beans <laughs> con aguacate, <laughs> right? I have less risk of creating a substance use disorder. Once I walk away from my culture, my traditions, and I me aculturo más uh, es, uh, uh, to the culture and moving in, my risk of creating a substance disorder increase. On video. <laughs> the message is keep eating rice and beans with aguacate. <laughs> no, and it's true because it's, 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 it, I, mean, and I say this because I see a lot of adolescents and parents are afraid of them not being accepted in school, right? Some of them don't want them to learn Spanish. The more you keep from your culture, the less chances you have of creating a substance disorder or a mental illness. Okay? And I would say I speak three languages. Where I speak English, Puerto Rican, and Spanish. So it's really important. And I would do that with my kids. I don't have kids, but if, I, if one day I have kids, I will keep them. I will take it to my mom. I mean, because it's really important. Okay? And it's 13 times. <laughs> they have a 13 time higher risk of creating a substance disorder if they walk away from their traditions. Okay? Um, so Hispanics, well, Mexicans, who is Mexican? You guys are everywhere. <laughs> and it's clear, right, you can walk here. I mean, it's, it's, I mean the, the, his, the history of being Mexican is 64%, 65% of the Hispanics in the U.S. are Mexican, followed by Puerto Ricans. But it's a huge difference, right? 60 versus 10%. And it's because you guys are closer, right? I mean, we, <laughs> need, we need to swim here. You just walk. <laughs> but that's, that's, that's the, his, uh, the history behind that, right? Um, and between Mexican and Puerto Rican, Mexicans are a higher risk of creating a substance use disorder versus Puerto Ricans. Cubans actually have a lot more protective factors. Yeah. I think the protective factor is uh, they, they talk about education. Education levels are Cuba is pretty high. Everyone knows the culture. I mean, even the taxi driver, the people that pick up the trash, the people <laughs> everywhere, anywhere you go, they have similar education levels. And that's a protective factor for them. So if you look at the charts, nicotine, cocaine, alcohol, opioids, Cubans are usually lower Education, but there's always the family component, right? We all have that component, and that's a protective factor for the Hispanics. Again, that stay on their tradition, because family is really important, so you have more support. Um, it's a changing nation, we talk a little bit about this. We are increasing, we're expanding, we're, we're everywhere. Uh, we're seeing more leaders, it's still pretty low, but we're seeing more people on Congress, 
right? More people that are in more diversity. Uh, CEOs are increasing, there are Hispanic. Uh, female CEOs are increasing in the 500 Fortune companies. So we're, we're making some changes, we're making some dents. Um, uh, the power is in numbers, and I, I'll, I'll put here Minnesota. Uh, so about in Minnesota, it, it sounds like back in 2014, 5%. I don't know if that have changed a lot. I don't know if someone has better numbers than four, like 5%, but about 5% of population in Minnesota are Hispanic. Okay, and I'm putting here the voter, right? Because we need to make some changes in our leadership, <laughs> and I don't want to get political. Because then we're going to be here for, for weeks and months. Um, but only 2% of the, of the Hispanic are el eligible in Minnesota. But we have the power of being 34%. What's going on? I will let that to you guys. Because we need more people motivated, more knocking doors. Please sign in, right, uh, to vote. Uh, again, more Mexicans, followed by Puerto Rican here in Minnesota, and this is Minnesota. And again, 4.7 percent are, so 5 percent are Hispanic. And of course, there is a tendency that it might du duplicate in duplicate in, in by 2030. If we're not like 10 years from now, we're going to see uh, at least 10 percent of Hispanic. So the time to talk about this is is, is now. Right? We want to prevent it from causing more issues and waste. Uh, so, okay, a little bit more about the opiate epidemic, and I do wanna have time for questions and, and interact with you more. So I'm gonna, I know someone else is, present, is presenting about this, so I'm not gonna uh, spend too much time on, on this, but uh, if, who is a physician here? Who works for physicians? No? Four physicians, with physicians, social workers, teachers. No teachers? We all teaching and teaching. We're all students too, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I grew up with teachers. My, my mom is a teacher, my, my grandma was a teacher, my, my sister's a teacher. <laughs> um, okay, but, so, yeah. So, I mean, it's sad to say, but of course we're prescribing more oxycodone even though we were not happening. I mean, the milli equivalents of, so we're prescribing more amount, more powerful opioids out there, okay? Which is sad, and I, was, I asked for physicians because you know what the uh, drug monitoring program is? So you, it's a state, I don't know, it's a platform that you can go in and check who is on an opioid, or when was the last time he was prescribed, the amount, and by who. It's a website. I use it every day. Well, every time, that number, the milli equivalence, right, of drugs that give me goosebumps, right? Sometimes, so average, no one should be on more than 90, right? Because that's a lot of opioids on your body a day. 2015, they were prescribing 640. No one is an elephant here, or a horse. That's to, force, to put someone to sleep forever, right? But that's what we're seeing. 65 plus age, my patients, when I see that, I, I call the physician, I call the PCP, I call the main manager, why are you doing? Mm. Then there is no HIPAA, CFR 42, that will stop me from doing that. Why? Because I'm collaborating with them, and it's about safety. And we can talk about HIPAA and CFR 42 all day long, because there is a misconception that I cannot call your doctor when I feel you are unsafe. And every time I call, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm stepping out of my, um, <laughs> my presentation a little bit, but this is really important. Every time I call a doctor and the receptionist say, this is against the law, I say, send me the law that you're talking about. <laughs> Because I'm worried about the patient. If the, if the doctor cannot see me now, I will call him in 10 minutes. Have any questions for your doctor? Like, do they, do they well, depends on the tone I'm calling. <laughs> Usually the first call is pretty nice. 
I send letters, I send facts. I know some people in the higher positions because of my positions. So that's the third stage. Fourth stage, I get the patient angry because I stopped decreasing the other medications. Okay, you don't want to take him up? Okay, so I might need to, because of interaction and worry, so I start decreasing all the medications, right? Uh, and at one point, I can call and report them. And they don't want that. They don't want that. Right? And CDC 2016, they send the CDC report. I mean, it's all over the news, right? You should not be doing this. <laughs> right? Um, okay. Uh, so, to put it in perspective, right? I mean, opioid overdose cause a lot of deaths, and it's more than motor vehicle accidents. So, yes. It's a public health. We should be panic about this, getting panic about this. Uh, you can, I mean, we talk about overdoses. Minnesota, uh, and this is, this is interesting. Uh, so we have the, the, the prescriptions, right? Which we have a spike here, 2009, 2010. This is where people start dying from the, what we were prescribing, physician were prescribing. Created a plateau with what's going on. Has not decreased. What kind of created a plateau here? Heroin spike here, 2012, 2013. That's where the the debt increased when you mix the opioid and the heroin, right? That transition, right? The heroin. Why? Heroin is cheaper. It's everywhere. I actually can walk outside my apartment and buy heroin. I, I, I live in an okay community, comparing to my patients. But I can buy heroin. One day I can I sit waiting for the boss, and this guy opened his jacket and he say, "Guy, you want to do business?" I was like, "No, I do not want to do business with you." But he was like, "A lot of pills, different names, different coding, different colors, wow. like that." Nice area. So my patient, I will tell you more story about my patients, but it's scary. Here, 2016, and I remember I talk about waves. We're seeing the wave of the synthetic opioids. And what's the one that's killing the most patients? <coughs> fentanyl. No one knew what fentanyl was before. 2016 is famous. That guy is famous. Fentanyl is a nemesis out there, right? And the funny part, it doesn't taste like anything. You can mix it. It's cheap as hell, and you can mix it with anything. You can mix it with PCP. You can mix it with smoking, your nicotine. You can mix it with anything. So uh, if you buy a pill that looks like a Xanax outside, <coughs> it might be fentanyl. OK? Next. Neonatal afternoon syndrome. You guys talk a lot about the kids, the kids before they are burn, right, before the baby's out, they're already suffering, right? So the increase, the withdrawal, this is the withdrawal symptoms after birth, they've been increasing with time. And again, this is a mix of drugs. People are not only using opioids, now they're mixing up with other stuff. Remember I talk about meth increasing, cocaine increasing, but also the benzodiazepines. Who are the benzodiazepines? Well, they're famous by Clonopin, Valium, Xanax, or Xanax. Well, my patients are Xanax. Um, what are my Xanax? Um, Xanax, Aprosolam, all those are benzodiazepines, and they are in a packet. These guys, you want an Oxycodone, they will give you a free Xanax, okay? It's business for them. Um, but also the diagnosis, right, with chronic, chronic medication, chronic, uh, medicine issue, medical issues. We talk about Hispanic are at higher risk of this. They're at higher risk for getting hep C. They're at higher risk for HIV. Uh, I get super anxious when my patient had that face that something happened, and I know it's because they, he was diagnosed with HIV at the age of 20. 
I know it's a chronic disease now, there's medication that works, but that phase is pretty strong. And it makes me anxious. Because not just getting the HIV, is how I'm gonna tell my family, mi abuela, what's gonna, mi abuela is gonna think when I call her in Puerto Rico, mm. right? I didn't get it from sex, <laughs> that would be okay. But I gotta inject him. Okay, next. Uh, behavioral health conditions, so Latino population in the U.S. is facing a public health crisis, and I want you guys to panic. I don't want you to go out here happy, I learned a lot. I want you to panic, okay? I want you to create some wave, I want you to panic, I want you to talk to your family, this is what's going on. Let's do something about it. Uh, you don't have to be a doctor to do something about it. We can all do a doctor, I mean, just educating yourself, talking the same, the same language, right? Customer service, when you see someone looking like that, please give it, I, I have business, business card everywhere where I go, I give my car, call me, I will help you. If I cannot help you, I will refer you to somewhere that I can help you. Um, so the role of disparity across all three key areas of behavioral health are important. So we're talking about also mental illness, behavioral health, uh, addiction, and when we talk about disparities, we're talking about education, transportation, food, uh, and medical services, right? Uh, so something I always think about is there's some models that talk about what comes first, the chicken or the egg. Remember that, right? It's a, it's a drug addiction before the depression or before the medical issues. And most of the studies say that the substance use disorder, um, and the depression, the mental illness, precede the substance use disorder. I would say most of the time, especially in adolescence, and that's what the data say, right? I think it was 47, 47% or more in adolescence, the depression or the sadness or something happened that created the substance use disorder, okay? So you guys talk about and I always talk about prevention before treatment because our kids, they're not getting education about this in schools. There is no, in, in, in Pennsylvania, we have an issue that we have one counselor per, I don't know, 300 kids, something like that. I don't know what's going on in Minnesota, but that's way too many. Way too many kids, right? It's about 300 per counselor. I mean, that's, and our counselors are not trained for substance disorder, right, or mental health. And then the referral process, once you find a case, why you deal with that case? So prevention, we need to talk more about this. I always, I always say to the governor that we should create a program of assessing the kids. Like, when you, you know, I mean, every kid has vaccination now. You need to go with vaccination. You cannot go inside the school. That's cool. Why not create an assessment for substance disorder or mental health before they go to school or before the year start every year? I mean, are you suicide, thinking about killing yourself? Why not? Well, we talk about the stigma. We talk about other stuff. Uh, so that's, that's part of the why not. But I think if we create a bill like that, that will probably would pass but we need to work together for that. Um, so meaningful access for behavioral health care for Latinos U.S. is a social justice issue, right? It's a social justice issue. And we can repeat that. It's not only because we're Hispanic, it's because everything that goes with being Hispanic, right? Uh, Latinos deserve a diverse, multidisciplinary, bilingual, and bicultural behavioral health workforce. And this is key. I mean, we talk about the hope for us and we need to create the niche when they feel safe, right? And you go back to customer service, customer service. When I talk about our organization, APM, I don't know, who's, who's, who's taking my time? I can talk forever. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Someone needs to say you have 10, 20, 30, or I will keep going. Um, who's, who's, who jobs is that? I don't know. <laughs> uh, so, we need to create a place that they feel safe, okay? Let's go next. <coughs> Is 
it next? No. <laughs> um, a little bit about Puerto Rico. Uh, so there's some economic indicators that we need to be careful, right? We, we are not the same. In Puerto Rico, U.S., for example, we are well, we're American citizens. That does, does, I mean, uh, my, my, my Indian family, they asked me about my green card many times, but <laughs> it's crazy. But uh, uh, six, six years dating, I was still looking for a green card. Um, <laughs> so median income is 18,000 in Puerto Rico versus 55 in U.S., right? And I say Puerto Rico, we all Hispanic, so it's a pretty great place to do research. Go, there is no minorities. We are the majority, right, because we are the same. Um, but education, employment, uh, living under pro property, oh, they're all risk factors for substance disorder. Um, and who present more with a substance disorder in the ER? We're talking about between the ages of 18 and 35, 40 years old. So those are the, the, go the golden age, right? This is what the people is looking for jobs. This is the people going to college. This is the people is creating families. So someone creating a substance disorder during those years create a wave of ec economic situation for the for the for the state for the for the for the country. So it's not just only for the family, right? It's happening. It's affecting the nation. Referrals are coming mostly for the justice system. I don't know if you know, guys. We have a lot of Hispanics. African American in, in, in prison. Okay? It's overwhelming. Two thirds of people in, in prison, in general, not only Hispanic, has a substance use disorder. Two thirds. 66%? That's a lot of people. Okay? You know, if they do, I don't know if they do substance use disorder treatment here in Minnesota in the prison system. Do we do? Yes? Great. Great, right, because New York does it too. Uh, but I think what, we've, what we're failing is when we discharge them to the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's the, and New York suffered the same situation, right? What do they do? What are the priorities for these guys, right? Is it housing, is it transportation, is it returning to the family? Those are priority. No to continue with the suboxone or the methadone. So they need a case manager or someone to be there for them. I think we're failing that and they're dropping out and probably going back to prison, most of them. So, I mean, that, that's something that we, we need, need to still work with. Next. Um, there's also non-fatal overdoses. I mean, a lot of people overdose that don't die, but still, right, an issue. Um, children entering, oh, what, so, oh. Next, yeah. <laughs> uh, indirect effect, we talk about kids, 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 and my company runs a foster home, right? Uh, foster home are places that you send the kid because DHS or the Department of Family or someone else took the kids because you were using drugs and there was no stable housing and all that. So that's not good, they're increasing. So kids in foster homes are increasing and because substance use disorders are increasing because Families cannot take care of the kids. Uh, so it's sad to say, but we just build. So we have 350 places to, in APA, my, my, my organization have 350 kids right now, all drug related. And we open, we're gonna open another 350 beds. We have a waiting list for these kids. Those are the things that make me shake, right? We are thinking about the future, but our future looks so bad because we are creating more places for these kids because we know we need more spaces. Is it good? No. I see that's a bad. Next. Uh, Native American, it's happening all, but it's happening more in our Native American populations, communities. You see, it's four times higher, right? Because there are more at risk, genetically, community, isolation of these communities, right? No communication, no transportation are creating that, 
okay? And we're seeing more Native American families being separated because of substance use and drugs. Could I just interject? Sure. I, I come from child welfare, <laughs> so I know the data. I think the other issue that's not talked about in the systems is the issue of institutional racism. Mm -hmm. So you compound that with some of the other stuff too, then it makes it a higher risk factor for natives and other groups that get into the child welfare system. Just want to make sure that was out there too. Thank you for that, thank you for that. It's a multiple, it's multiple, I mean, it's, it's a lot of confounding factors when we talk about these data. Uh, again, drug uh, mortality rates and uh, overdose by race, so again, more in American Indians, right? We see a lot more and more in 2015 to 2016, so only a year apart, we have a increased 30%, right? Especially in the American Indian versus African Americans and white. And this all data from you guys. This is the Department of Health of Minnesota. And why is this important? I mean, social determinants, grow, live, work, age, all this place uh, a risk, right, for, for, uh, for our patients. Um, and there's uh, circumstances, and you talk, I mean, now we're, we're in 2020 and people is running for, for office. Uh, you're talking a lot about this stuff, right? I don't, can't, I don't think they can put their hair together. I mean, we're, how many Democrats are running? They started with 30 Democrats running, <laughs> right? I was tired already from the beginning. The first week I was like, oh, way too many people. I don't know, how many are there now, eight? Six, but well, still, they cannot put their hair together with one plan. Five more minutes, God. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, health equities. Uh, so we need to create highest level of care for all people. United States Office of Disease Prevention and Health Promotion have this great idea that we can do it all together, we work together, but nothing has happened. Okay, so what's equity, right? Which one is equity, left or right? Right, it's equity, right. We're giving the, what they need, right? Equality is left. We say we gave them the same, but no people is the same. No man is an island. No woman is an island, right? We need to work together. We need to give what they need, okay? So Latino and Hispanic addiction treatment in the United States, this is what we need. Language, fluency, education, attainment, economic, insurance coverage, health, okay? And I say this because you cannot create a silo community health clinic that is not prepared to have Hispanic. And it needs to start from the first person that they see on the front door. Receptionists need to understand. Bilingual, not understanding only the language, because speaking Spanish, my wife speaks Spanish, but her conversation is two sentences, <laughs> right? She cannot talk to my mom. Two sentences. Hola, como esta señora? Muy bien. Bien, gracias. Half an hour of silence. Right? That's not customer service. Right? My office is, is pretty close to the receptionist, right? And I, I cannot tell you how many times I need to interrupt a session with a patient because someone come in, on the, in the, to the office asking for help. And they say, I cannot see you today. The doctor is too busy. And drive, drive me crazy. I have not fired anyone yet, because <laughs> that blows my mind. I need to get out, go down. Sir, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? Um, blah, blah, blah. Here's the information. I will have you someone. You will see someone today. Maybe not me, but a counselor. You will go home with a face, a name, a number, and a date, the date I will see you. OK? That's customer service. That take me three minutes. By the time the guy go back outside, we lost him. And I will find him in the newspaper. That's not good. Okay? So we can move this, but this is health system. We have a lot to do. We need to work together from dental care, behavioral health, primary care, all of them. When I go to back to Puerto Rico, dentists are the ones doing the job. There is no psychiatrist where I, where I came from, from Vieques. I came from a really small island. My family is there, right? It's famous because of the Navy. We kick out the Navy. That's what people say, right? Uh, so, but there is no psychiatrist in the island. 
dentists, primary care physician, three primary care physician run the mental health services in that island. Three. I've been doing work there for 15 years, and we're besties now. <laughs> These guys run the mental health. Okay? Um, Hereditary intervention, we have evidence based, some evidence based com counseling medications. Uh, medication, we have Suboxone, we have Vivitrometanol, and those are the FDA approved. They're not the only ones. They have medication that have been off label. FDA approved medications are methadone, buprenorphine, or Vivitro with natrox and common pills, and Vivitro is injectable four weeks. Uh, there's harm reduction, needle exchange, and safe injection sites. If you want to get too political with injection sites, we can talk for two weeks about those, uh, but it's creating a lot of wave in Pennsylvania. Uh, it's they work in Australia, they work in Canada, there's enough data behind them. Again, the stigma, who wants an injection site on their community? That's the problem. Same happened with the methadone clinics, right? They get afraid, the community is afraid of having addicts in their community. People with substance use disorder are fathers, are sons, are their own family, and they don't want them there. So what do we do with that? Um, that prevention, well, Naloxone. I have two naloxone on my back. I always carry them. I have one. You can go to the next one. I think the uh, choice. Okay, you can go to the uh, next one. Okay, before okay before I talk about the naloxone, that's okay. You can leave it there. Um, so these are the FDA approved naloxone. It's an antagonist. I, you do want you to know this antagonist, right? And there is a lot of misconception about that. People get afraid because it's not, it's not an opioid, right? And when my patient gets, oh, I'm, I'm afraid of injections, that's the first cue they do. They say, I'm afraid of injection. And I was like, can I see your arms? <laughs> I was like, stop it right there. <laughs> stop it. Bad, bad, I, I have a dog, bad dog. No, you need to stop it right there, okay? Every four weeks. Uh, the partial agonist, buprenorphine, partial agonist is not entirely agonist, right? Huh? Can I have one more minute? Sorry. <laughs> one more minute. And her, uh, uh, Latino. <laughs> a methadone is a full agonist. There is a lot of stigma around methadone. I used to run a clinic on methadone in, when I was in Connecticut for a year. We have 10,000 patients on methadone. 10,000 patients on methadone. Okay? 80% of them were stable. I've seen how methadone change life. They, are, they can work. They wake up at 5 a.m. to get dose. They go to work after that. Okay? First gold standard during pregnancy. Okay? If you're pregnant and you have an opioid use disorder, methadone is a gold standard. Okay? Uh, we can move that. Uh, best practice. You need to have a biopsychosocial cultural model, right? You need to ev ev evaluate all that. <laughs> it's not how many times you use, right? It's more than that. Where you came from, are you spiritual? Where is your family, education level, right? What do you like to do? Hobbies. Uh, okay, you can move. Okay, we, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Okay, now Luxon. Move to the next one. I think there's more pictures. No, okay. No, okay, you can <laughs> move. Move, I just want to, yeah, but move back. That one, that one, that one. Um, so this is my organization, Theory of Change, and I do believe in this, right? This is my passion. I, I believe in this every day. We need to do it as a community. There is no way. There is no way me, Hector, can create a, a, a prior practice to change this. It's not gonna happen. I will create more issues than not. Uh, we need a neighborhood with the family, with the child. That's why we believe in the family, neighborhood, and the city, right? Community reintegration is key, right? These are human, they need to go back to, to, to their families, right? So that's why we have a foster care, we have education, we have a partner with big hospital. I teach a pen, I teach a Dex Drexel, Thomas Jefferson. I teach everywhere because Everywhere is the community, right? We need to touch every corner of the community. If we are not in every corner, people will not come to us, 
right? We speak Spanish, we speak English, some of us we speak Portuguese, but we our is our key is like those doors are open to you and your family. Kids, adults, old people. I see Medicare, Medicaid. If you are not insurance, I will see you. But we'll talk about insurance later on, okay? But we will see you. And I can, I can keep talking forever, but <laughs> she, she's getting mad with me, so <laughs> <laughs> I will say thank you. Thank you. I, and I, I, and they asked me to come here for an hour, and I will stay all weekend, because I, I want to know from you guys. Okay, um, we like to take few uh, stuff with me. I want you to take few things from me, and I hope this conversation doesn't end here. Okay, I mean I have a, I have a, f you can find me on Twitter, you can find me in LinkedIn, send me a message. My phone is kind of public, uh, so I'm better with texting. Please do. Collaboration, you want something to, to present somewhere, write something, I'm always up to that. I mean, my wife say you need to stop, I say you need to stop. Because <laughs> we need to be, we need to be active in this, okay? Thank you guys. Ooh.